Okay, this meeting is being recorded. This is the Town of Fairfield's Affordable Housing Committee meeting of Wednesday, July 12th. Uh, we're meeting in the second floor conference of the Old Town Hall. Um, we have a quorum this evening. Um, and without further ado, I guess we'll call the meeting to order at 7.05. Here, go ahead. Welcome, everyone. Um, I think we've just done introductions, so we probably don't need to redo that. Uh, I think our first item of business is to um, is to review minutes of last month's meeting, and then we'll jump into our, our guest speakers and reintroduce our guest speakers. Very concisely done. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I like <laughs> bullet points. Uh, minutes look very good. Uh, able to get on one page too. A anyone have a comment or a question? Or? A question, yeah. Um, Mark, it says that you said last month that you were expecting to receive a building permit for 244 Ridge Yes. Yeah. We, we, we have know? a building permit now, yes. Okay. So we had it back like two months ago. Uh, well, we had applied. It took a yeah. while. So. Okay. Would anyone like to uh, move approval to May? I'll move. Steve moves. Second. Bob seconds. All in favor? Unanimous. Great job in the minutes. Gretchen. I think we actually got the building permit that week. Excellent. Okay, so our next item is uh, we're, we're delighted to have Carolyn and Kevin from, um, from uh, Habitat of Humanity of Coastal Fairfield County. And... Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, so again, I'm Carolyn Vermont. Excited to be here. Excited for this opportunity to build in Fairfield. Um, you know, Habitat has never built in Fairfield before. I love Fairfield. I've spent a lot of years here at Fairfield University for my undergrad and graduate degrees. And, um, you know, try to come to many events here in Fairfield. So to have an opportunity um, for Habitat families um, to live in Fairfield is a true blessing. Now to get to other information, uh, defer to our COO. Yeah. Do you want to give any, uh, I'm not sure how familiar you all are with Habitat's program. Should we give like an overview? Why don't you go ahead, Kevin. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, you know, we're an affordable housing developer. Um, we cover coastal Fairfield County. So we cover from Greenwich to Stratford up and down the coast. Uh, and we built 280 homes uh, in our service area, uh, seven townhomes in Stanford, about 25 homes in Stratford, and the balance in Bridgeport. Um, obviously, affordability of land has driven a lot of uh, where we're building. Um, so we build our homes, keeping our costs as low as possible, using as much donated material and as much donated labor as we can get. And then we sell the homes uh, to low-income homeowners. Homeowners make between 40 and 70% of the area median income. Um, so a little bit lower end of, of the typical affordable housing um, uh, AMI uh, range. And we sell them with a 30-year interest-free mortgage. And that's what really makes our homes affordable for our home buyers. Um, so they purchase the home, the sales price is uh, set not to exceed 30% of their monthly income. Um, so varies based on the family, but generally it's costing us about $200,000 uh, to build a home in terms of hard costs, um, you know, building materials and subcontracted labor. We're um, add land into that, uh, into that equation. It can drive it up quite a bit. Um, and then we're selling that home for typically around the $180,000 mark. The homeowners are kind of getting an upfront subsidy as well as a 30-year interest-free mortgage. Um, that's really what's necessary to keep it affordable at that income level. So, And to add, Kevin, and no down payment. Right, oh, yeah. Mm, wow. mm -hmm. But yeah. they have to provide some sweat. Yeah, so in lieu of a down payment, they do what we call sweat equity. So um, that. that's work on their home and mm -hmm. other habitat homes. So again, mm -hmm. that varies based on family size, but it's Actually, 150 hours per adult in the family, up to 450 hours. So it's a, a pretty significant.
significant commitment in that respect. Um, yes. Uh, are they able, the homeowners, after they buy it, are they able to um, ride the, the increase in equity value all the way up, or are there caps as to how much they can get? Yeah, so the Fairfield situation will be a little bit unique because it's actually on town-owned property. But our typical model, um, the homes we build in Bridgeport, the homes are sold with a 40-year deed restriction on affordability. So they can't resell the home within that, uh, that time period to anyone over 80% of AMI. Uh, and then it's structured such that the first mortgage is for the sales price. There's a second silent mortgage that's forgivable um, when the first mortgage is paid. Uh, and that's for the difference between the appraised value and the sales price. So like a typical home in Bridgeport, um, typically they'll appraise for like between 280 and 310, depending on the neighborhood. Uh, if they buy that for 180, they're going to have their first mortgage and then the, you know, the $12,000 mortgage that essentially is disincentivizing them to flip the home, uh, mm -hmm. uh, right? Because we want to preserve the unit of affordable housing. Right. Um, so it's structured such that we have first right of refusal and get paid off their, their first mortgage. And we'll usually buy back two or three homes annually, um, you know, with, a, with 180 completed homes, just people moving for jobs or downsizing at this point. The organization's been around for 37 years, right? So there's some folks that bought three bedroom homes years ago and now don't need a three bedroom home. Uh, and those cases, we'll generally buy them renovate them as needed, and then resell them. Um, the house in Fairfield, I think on Fairfield Woods Road, the habitat sort of helped, um, right, a rehab? Yeah. yeah. Um, we don't do a lot of uh, rehab work. Um, so generally, we're primarily a new construction builder, right. um, uh, mostly because, you know, the housing market here uh, doesn't make buying a, a fixer right. upper any more affordable than for us uh, building a new home. And we're also able to then provide a homeowner with a, a brand new Energy Star rated home versus uh, renovated. Uh, we've done a handful of, of home repair projects on kind of a case by case basis. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's it makes sense if it's keeping somebody in a house that right. they otherwise right. can't right. afford, right. you know, but. Our real primary driver is getting getting folks into long term housing. Uh, yeah. Thank you. You guys are all familiar with 240, 240, it's now 240, 246 Greenfield Street. <laughs> we have addresses 240, now. That took a long time to get the addresses assigned, as Kevin can attest. But you know, the town is through the contribution from the Housing Trust Fund is contributing sure. the land. Um, which is basically ground lease to habitat and to the successors and title um, for a dollar a year. You know. So that's how we're structuring this. And of course, we're looking for other opportunities that might present mm -hmm. themselves. In Fairfield, we had an individual approach us, uh, approach the town through the first select woman about you know whether the town had interest not so much in the property for affordable housing, but thinking the town might have some other use for the for the property. It was downtown uh, on a 9,000 plus square foot lot, according to the survey we have. And we looked at it, but, you know, sales being what they are, land price being what they are. Um, you know, even our appraisal, which was, I think, you know, Reflective of the market conditions, but it wasn't overly aggressive. I came back in the thousand dollar range uh, based on comparable sales. Sure. Um, a little less than that, but then um, you know we informed the uh, referring with a few a few folks and with the first select woman and others informed the property owner that you know we have uh, couldn't make an offer on the property. But I did provide that to Kevin to ha and to Carolyn uh, for Habitat's consideration, with the understanding that we would be um, we would entertain an application for financial assistance to help with the acquisition uh, from the housing trust fund. We would share it ourselves. You know, 
as of today, made an offer on the property. We're not. Oh, really? We're not uh, terribly optimistic, <laughs> but you, 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 you never know. Um, resonate with. Uh, with and it's a residence, right? It's not commercial property. It is. A, it's a single-family home. It's, uh, it's currently approved as a single-family home. It is big enough, even under our existing zoning, to do a two-family. Uh, you know, honestly, when we looked at it, we thought, you know, while it's not consistent with zoning, we'd like to do sure. a little bit more than a, just a family. That was the reaction of a lot of people that I talked to, including the first select one, who said, you know, it'd be nice if we could consider doing more than two right. units on the on the property. So that, I think if it if it were to come to pass, that would be our our hope and expectation that we find a way to do something yeah. more than just because again the cost is such. Even if uh, they accept that offer, we're talking about you divide that right. by three or four units. Let's say sure. four units. You're still paying a lot on a per unit basis for the land. That's right. typically what drives development deals. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You can't afford to pay, you know. Unfortunately, that and that's the what we talked about last meeting uh, in terms of our desire to create more uh, missing middle type housing here. We have mm -hmm. uh, stock of two, three, and four families. And cost is about you know putting a lot of effort into it. So. Mm -hmm. But I know you guys are looking for other opportunities here, and you have some money that you can deploy thanks to a very generous yeah. grant. So. Yeah, we're you know we're really anxious to build more in Fairfield. Um, it's a obvious um, logical partner of the town of Fairfield. Has been very proactive in in developing affordable housing, maybe more so than some of your neighbors. Yeah. Um, uh, and you know it's it's near enough to our current operations that it's not it's sure. not as big a challenge logistically for us to to build here. Um, you know that as Mark alluded to, the challenge of course is is property acquisition costs, right? Particularly because we can't pass those costs on to our home buyers. So right. it's essentially just requiring us to provide them with a greater subsidy upfront subsidy. But um, we did get a significant financial gift from Mackenzie Scott. Um, Year ago now, and uh, one of the driving driving um, aims with that gift was expanding affordable housing opportunities in communities where there aren't as many. So, uh, so that's you know some ones we would hope to to be able to leverage for for acquisitions in Fairfield. Um, and so, as as Mark alluded to, we made an offer today. I'm not terribly optimistic based on the owner's perceived value of their property, sure. but. Time will tell. Maybe, uh, maybe if things cool off over the next few weeks, they uh, they mm -hmm. might circle back around to us. But, but to that end, if you all keep an eye out for for mm -hmm. opportunities throughout town, you know we're we're anxious to we're anxious yeah. to do more in Fairfield. We're mm -hmm. hoping that 244 Greenfield will be the first of mm -hmm. of many units we can build there. So yeah, but those are duplexes you're building on Greenfield. Right, but typically, you build single family. Uh, we build a, a pretty equal mix oh, of yeah. single okay. family and side by side two family homes. Okay. Um, yeah. Maybe pushing the envelope a little bit. We do have, um, I know the, this group is all aware of our efforts to redevelop the Parkview Commons. You know, we've been in the process of reacquiring properties that have become available. Properties to date, this is the old Navy housing. Oh, yeah. Right. Um, and so we have four properties to date. Uh, two of which are still occupied by holdover tenants, one of whom is home, new home in Florida and is relocating as of the end of, of uh, August, early so, mm -hmm. um And a fifth unit is in foreclosure, as we've been tracking for right. about a year or two, mm -hmm. two years now, and is slated for a sale by in early August. For prior support and an authorization we do have available to, to purchase that unit if it becomes available and the foreclosure goes through. Unfortunate. Um, I tried to work both with the property owner and the bank to 
Right. Short circuit the process, but it seems like it's on a, um, on a course of so um, I go and offer in on that. I had circulated earlier this week the RFQ, RFP, we follow a similar process that we did um, with uh, Greenfield Street and solicit qualification statements and proposals. Developers, uh, those engaged in this work, nonprofit developers. Here too, again, you know, we we're essentially paying about three hundred thousand dollars back for these properties. We're giving, um, and you know, if you're looking, you know, again on a changing from a single family to a two family, that's a lot per unit for land cost. If we could do something uh, more in terms of a three. Two scattered in that that would be a little bit easier. So I think we're already committed to providing that as our as our subsidy and support, not only to preserve, reposition the housing so it's above uh, requirements, uh, but also to hopefully expand a very desirable neighborhood. That we went to purchasing. Uh, Street soon. And I would just double or second Carolyn and Kevin's uh, request. If you see some uh, dilapidated property or well-loved home in your area that might be on the be on the market, let us know. Or another development site. I know we've been looking at town property, which has been kind of slim pickings. Right. Um, you know, the kind of the orphan properties around that no one seems to they're not, they haven't been developed for a reason. Yeah. <laughs> we, yeah. Yeah. But, but we're really hopeful that, that you know, we, uh, that, that, that the, the town becomes uh, as engaged as, or as interested as we are in looking for properties that could be repurposed. And, um, We've been on the lookout, and we'll, we'll continue to be on the lookout. Hopefully, something will happen. We've also been trying to um, pushing for some, some zoning revisions that would enable us to to potentially uh, convert more properties to duplex mm -hmm. uh, duplex configuration. And there are some zoning revisions that are likely in the mix. Maybe not as as ambitious as we we we'd, we'd hope, but but still a first step. We think so. They think things are looking up. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin, if we found a house that's coming on the market, how quickly can you guys move? Because if we call the town, <clears throat> it takes them four or five months to do anything. And can you operate as quickly as the private sector? Uh, so we have a board that we have to get build consensus with you know major expenses, but that can happen relatively quick. It's definitely quicker than four or five months. Yeah. Um, you know, give it a couple weeks. I think we can mm -hmm. have an offer and you know thirty day closing. So I think we can be pretty competitive. Mm -hmm. um, again, you know, it's going to have all cash closing. Right, yeah. right. Like the offer we made today was was uh, an off, all cash offer, thirty day closing, standard contingencies. Um, you know, it's just it's two hundred thousand dollars less than they perceive their property to be worth, which mm -hmm. and the so reality of it is the value is probably somewhere between the two of our, you know. Uh, the other thing that Habitat can do, and I know this group has talked about, you know, the advantages of having a five hundred one c three and donation. There are five hundred one c three. They can, uh, you know, if people are looking for a partial tax write or mm -hmm. a complete tax write off, they can do that. They can. Um, provide, you know, not only cash to purchase the home, but if it's less than what the value, the perceived value, the appraised oh. value is, that property, they can document that so they can get a tax write-off or tax That's something that they're accustomed to. Yeah, in some cases that might make even, make, make us more competitive with a private market offer, right, where they can get they can get a tax write-off that might offset some of their tax liability on right. their sale. Um, and they're not paying realtor fees. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. 
and you feel like somebody approaching the town sure. as opposed to a real estate agent. Yeah, I think they just thought because of its location, proximity to other town property, maybe the town yeah. would have some interest. Mm -hmm. um, wasn't really oh. what we had in mind, but you know, we thought, well, you know, housing would make, make a lot of sense here. Um, so that was was first select one's initial reaction was, well, we don't need it for that purpose, but right. how about we think about affordable housing? So, right. You know, at least. All right, that's good. Right, that's progress. Okay. You have an advocate at the top. You do. You're doing, and uh, I think you know. Again, this model, the model that you guys uh, methodology resonates with a lot yeah. of people. Uh, yeah. You know, not only the home ownership oftentimes is is, easy, is an easier sell, um, but also the, the sweat equity piece, the piece, uh, mm -hmm. and the fact that you you leverage so much to not only for your donations, but the materials and labor. Really, a community project, and I think a lot of people there positive notes. And I'm I'm just shocked that we haven't had a project that we could work with that we're finally. And, uh, Kevin's working hard. We have the building permit, but he's working hard to get the site cleared so we can actually have a groundbreaking uh, because uh, again that's that's an opportunity not only for mm -hmm. you all to to uh, show what the housing trust fund the affordable housing committee is all about but all and progress we've made in these but also to that to also to their own horn and, and maybe sure. that will also generate some additional leads patients but other people might think well I maybe mean, I have a piece of property that Maybe that would. We do have a couple pieces of property that we should talk about at some point. Look at them, uh, but um, thank you both for. Yeah, thanks for having us. And um, Fearful Rotary invited me last month to do a presentation. Nice. Um, so they're interested in getting involved, help us build, help us find funds, money. Um, Great. So we're excited about that also. Super. How do you People find the excited fund? about a groundbreaking? So. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> where, that's, are that's guys, cool. where are you located? He's 1542 Barnum Avenue in oh, Bridgeport. So you yeah. are close. Oh, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. I don't know if you know where Frankie's Diner is. Oh, yeah, I know sure. Frankie's oh, Diner. Oh, one block before Frankie's I've Diner. Only, I've only been there once, but I know. Oh, okay. <laughs> how, how do you identify the potential purchasers? Do you have people lined up for Greenfield? Uh, yeah, so we have a rolling admissions process. So every couple months we'll have an info session out in a community space, you know, public library, churches, things of that nature. Prospective applicants can attend that. Learn about the program requirements, namely the income requirement, right. the sweat equity requirement, and yeah. they have to currently be living in substandard housing. Um, so physically substandard, what we all think of, you know, a leaky roof or uh, overcrowding or excessive housing costs. So we spend um, of, of uh, Fairfield County tenants alone. Especially um, in that income bracket. Right. Um, so, uh, so they attend an info session, they find out about the requirements of the program, they can fill out a, an application um, to apply. Uh, if they are below or above income, we have partner uh, organizations we refer them to. Um, if they look like they, they are in the right income range, then they'll, they'll complete a full application. We have a family selection committee on our board that meets the family, helps the vetting process, evaluates their need. Um, <coughs> And then uh, accept flex whether they're accepted into the program. Uh, so we don't have families specific for 244 Greenfield yet. We're intending to do another um, info session, hopefully here in Fairfield later this year. Um, you know, okay. obviously it's uh, ideally we'd find some folks that are currently living in Fairfield that need yeah. affordable housing yeah. and. Um, yeah, so that's they're there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. they call yeah. every 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 yeah. week. Wow. Yeah, yeah. I mean, 
mean, a typical info session, it's not uncommon to have 100 uh, oh. folks attend yeah. a, uh, you know, yeah. uh, an info session and yeah. probably 30 or 40 families represented in mm -hmm. that, in that 100 people. Uh, so the, the need is, is great. Um, we build a lot more than our 10 to 12 homes oh, annually oh, and, oh, and so on. Do you have the capacity to build more than that internally? Uh, we yes, we have the capacity. It, it's mostly driven by funding, right? Yeah. Um, you know, providing pretty significant mm -hmm. subsidies. So that's that's the the importance of you know uh, support from communities like yourselves and the housing trust really, really makes mm -hmm. our work possible. forward to continuing to work with you all. Thank you for your commitment to affordable housing generally. It's a uh, marvelous work, I know. So, uh, this is yours. Yeah. 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 We, uh, we get the uh, privilege of giving a homeowner their first set of keys. Yeah. Uh, oh, that must be awesome. That must be pretty rewarding. Really 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 for sure. Yeah. Yeah. We did the lottery for the Navy housing site. I think the, the Board of Selectmen universally thought that was Wow. Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, people were just, you know, they were just glad. So, well, you're welcome to stick around if you want. Yeah, and I know you probably have other things that you got to do. Oh, Carolyn, please, you tell me, Carolyn. No, thank <laughs> you. <laughs> Oh, we can, I can stick around. We, we have, uh, we'll, we'll give it, yeah, we're, I think we're just going to go through yeah, a couple of things that exactly. are on the housing plan. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, okay. I'm, I'm sorry, clearly Nina's not coming. Okay. She's yeah. at a funeral. Oh, yeah. There's so moving on there, Irv? Yeah, so, so next item on the agenda is a uh, discussion of our affordable housing plan. Um, we have uh, uh, 11 objectives that are built into our um, five-year affordable housing plan that was that was uh, uh, launched last year. Uh, we had prior plans, but this is the most recent plan. And so we're we're focusing on five of them right now, paying attention to five of them in particular right now, and they address um, uh, our, our set aside, our affordable set aside percentage uh, is is one. A second is, is trying to assist the, uh, the housing authority. Uh, a, a third is, uh, is is looking for middle housing opportunities. Um, a fourth has to do with uh, uh, the housing trust fund and developing uh, additional guidelines for the housing trust fund. And a fifth area has to do with just general outreach. So we we were going to talk about all five of these areas. In, in, in probably not a completely coordinated way, but it'll all get done. Uh, so sort of like making sausage, I guess. <laughs> um, so in in as part of of our effort to be as informed as we can be, we've begun the process of reaching out to to organizations that have been um, either peer organizations to ours or um, or governmental or quasi governmental organizations that we we can learn from. And we've already begun the process of, of setting up people to come to our meetings, or in some cases, we're we're reaching out to have sessions. Uh, like Steve and I had had a, a session that uh, we we did, I guess, last week, this week, or the week before. Yeah. yeah, about ten days ago, <laughs> with uh, with um, uh, with Westport, and uh, so we'll be talking with a number of organizations like this, and uh, in terms of gathering more information. But, um, but so, so the, 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 one of the things we're struggling with is we'd like to increase the set-aside percentage, but uh, we know there's some obstacles, some economic obstacles that we're, we're facing right now. And so one of the things we're probing is with these other towns is, is what success has they had in, in varying uh, set-aside percentages. And uh, so, for instance, we learned from Westport that they've 
they apply a 20 percent uh, percentage in two zones for poor affordable housing. Mm -hmm. uh, and they claim that they haven't had any pushback mm -hmm. on that or, or resistance from builders. You know, they've been under a moratorium from H3G for four years, and it just ended in March. And so, and then our economy is not the same. You know, it's not uh, as um, welcoming it is for developers. So I'm not surprised. But they do 20 percent. And, and that's really all they do. They don't do 15, they don't do 12, they don't do 10, they do 20. And no pushback on the on the economic side. That the developers know what they're walking into, what the percentage is, and they're able to still able to get the, the deal done. Like I said, they've had a, a moratorium for a, a long time, and um, developers have the opportunity of working with the local government or doing A30G. And so now that the developers can, can do A30G in, in Westport, that'll be a, a good test as to whether or not 20% is workable. If it's not, developers will go to A30G. Yeah, so we have, uh, you know, homes benefit, we have an inclusion rate as far as any element aside, not less. Then in our TOD overlay zone, 12%. Um, we had some conversation. In fact, the, this committee advocated for a higher percentage. Our request, um, even higher, um, and we had a little bit of pushback. Uh, we were at arrived at 12%. So, and then we've had a different financial situation before. It was you know lost interest rate. Building materials weren't quite so privately. So and we're, you know, Fairfield's part of the Greater Bridgeport area, so Westport's in a different part of the Norwalk Stanford area. So that there's income for even the and our costs aren't that much different. So our housing market, unfortunately, performs like Norwalk and Stanford and Westport, but we're our income levels, which is good in a way because we need to be at, at a lower income level, but it does create some challenges. We've been looking around to see if we can find some evidence to support a higher uh, threshold requirement, and make sure that we test it enough um, that we feel like there are certainly communities that a threshold and say, hey, we've got a 20% requirement, but they don't actually produce any units. Um, we don't want to necessarily right. do that if it's not going to be feasible, because right. then people go the other route. So there are a couple options for us. One is you know, looking at the involved in that. So calling different towns. We actually, all, all of us, all the committee, looked at survey of, of ones that we were most interested in. The other area that a lot of what we do is informed by land use regulation. Zoning. Um, so the town has been engaged Right, which is, I believe, uh, to be concluded by November. Mm -hmm. We've been anxiously waiting this because mm -hmm. there's like, uh, little appetite to do anything else before that process right. has been. There's a lot of things that we've identified that might provide additional opportunities. Our very large parking lots, deciding whether or not we need parking. Um, so, so Bob, Bob uh, we had a meeting with our with our planning and zoning leadership uh, uh, team, uh, I guess uh, within the last two weeks. And Bob and, and Mark were there, and, and uh, um, we had we had a pretty interesting discussion. Bob set up a, a, a kind of a exhibit A of an overparked development, mm -hmm. and had a really good exchange with the planning and zoning team. They acknowledged that we 
clearly have a problem that needs to be addressed. And I think the hope is that once we get the main uh, POCD uh, revision done in November, we can move to to, uh, to this and other important. Uh, part of it is, as you mentioned, they were doing some up, proposing some upzoning, um, very limited. Uh, shared with uh, the, with me, and I shared with planning and zoning staff. Norwalk is looking at doing some upzoning to provide for two family uh, units in previously single family. So there's been <laughs> some uh, that's part of the proposal that the planning and commission here is considering, but on a more limited. We're hoping this will be just the start. That you know, the POC is only reviewed, you know, revised every ten years. Ten years or so, but but these zoning iterations can be made with much more, much greater frequency, and we're hoping that this is just the start in terms of these zones. It would be uh, areas that be rezoned from A to C or from from B to C. Um, and then the town on the land. We talked about that briefly before. We for about the last year we've been we've been looking at properties, town-owned properties that we thought that there were that were you know sewer and water. That we thought had some potential, and every time we suggest something, you know, somebody throws up a roadblock. You know, and, and in some cases with very good reason. But um, we're not giving up. We're going to continue to pursue those. And I, I guess I'm detecting more acknowledgement or greater acknowledgement from the part of our leadership that that hey, we 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 can make this happen, and it, it's logical that we make it happen. But it's it's going to take some time. And um, and then in terms of uh, of, of outreach, uh, maybe we could talk about some of those issues. Um, we had a very successful um, ADU seminar uh, last uh, November uh, that that, um, uh, that 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 Bob MC Mark up uh, Mark uh, orchestrated on Bob MC and uh, with with our planning and zoning. Uh, leadership there and had quite a turnout at the Fairview Museum. So we're hoping to do that again uh, this, this fall. And uh, in addition, we are, are hopeful of, um, of affirming up our, um, you know, housing trust fund guidelines and also having a, a general communication with the public uh, about um, the housing trust fund and the, the role that it can play and, and will play, and, and how they can help to make the uh, housing trust fund bigger. Uh, so, uh, so we've got those two items that we want to start talking about. Trust fund is currently funded. Best on any new construction or additions to properties that do not otherwise contribute to. If you do have a provision for affordable housing in your development, you're asked to provide some as part of your inclusionary zoning obligation. But what other properties that get a catch? So we have a ten, you know, ten units or more. Uh, we have we've had recently seen some nine unit developments. Um, so <laughs> we get them this way. We'll make a contribution. Uh, so uh, you know, right now. Uh, we currently have a balance of nine hundred thousand dollars, nine hundred eighty. Have reserve for the acquisition housing site. We'll have a pretty healthy balance, under about six hundred. And that's available. I mean, we've we've deployed it. Right now, for primarily acquisition of land, uh, particularly where the town has either an interest in the property or has owning property like Greenfield, leverage that purchase with property. Uh, but we've had a lot of um, had some interest from other developers. Uh, we've done some work on terms of rehab. Acquisition and rehab of existing multi 
Um, and we've been using community development block grant funds for that purpose, but they're needed. And our CDBG dollars are about $500,000 overall annually, and uh, we can commit about maybe 100 for multifamily acquisition and rehab, uh, <coughs> given our other obligations, goes by pretty quickly. So we've been able to um, basically subsidize some developments in order of 25 to 30K per unit uh, as a second mortgage obligation finance conventionally, um, but with in exchange for a 40-year uh, deed reserve. Is, uh, our, our term loan is forgivable over that 40 year period, so it's a balance loan. Um, and they can opt out early, so it's not I really get up that. that um, but we've gotten some interest, and the other thing that makes it work is that uh, typically we're providing these units rental housing for people with. So the housing authority has a pretty aggressive payment on in line with market conditions and market rent. And we're able to use that, and the combination of those things provided, I think, here we like to do more. Uh, and so that is an area that, you know, the downside is that not necessarily the way that it's structured without a fixed 40-year restriction will probably merit uh, housing unit equivalency points. From but it will contribute to our affordable housing industry. That we we all saw the newspaper article earlier in December of that this past year, which said people with vouchers can't find housing, and had a developer say, "I can do that. I can build you housing." And I said, "What do you need?" And he said, "Well, I could use some some rehab money." So that's how it started. So we got some rehab money and put them in touch with the housing authority. She had a Carol Martin has a whole bunch of people that you know need housing. And uh, away we went. But you know, I'm, he's he's anxious to start working on more projects. I don't have any money until October one at this. Point. So possibly we could look at that. But again, that's where it comes into talking about what our objectives are and how do we evaluate that opportunity versus opportunity working with Habitat. It sounds like a lot of money, but it's really not. Um, it gets replenished, but slowly. So it's we have to weigh those criteria and see. We're balancing the political objectives associated with the 830G with the with the real human need that we all see and 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 of course. So they're they're they're, they're two important strategies that were that are kind of at the heart of our affordable housing plan. Well, for us, I mean. It Becomes almost uh, an important milestone for us to get to the moratorium application yeah. point, so we can kind of determine our own destiny, and then you know at least people feel better about oh we've actually made some progress. Yeah. That's really the only measuring stick. It's very hard to look at you know when you have 20,000 units in town, go from 2.58 to two. not. Uh, Mean something to the people that are housed, right. but it's not it's not an eye popping number. What else do you have on your agenda there? I've covered the housing trust fund. Yeah, so I, I think um, we probably want to drill down further into some of these areas. You know, maybe talk about some of our specific plans and for um, the ADU meeting for the. Maybe for the housing trust fund meeting, um, it's, it make it less it get, make it less interesting from here on in. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, and Carolyn says, yeah, I, I hear you. <laughs> I have to run, but Kevin will be here with you. But thank you all. Thank it's you much, Carolyn. So it's great to have you with us. Yeah. Right. Good to see okay. you again, yes. as always. So I think what we could talk about is is some of those, you know, setting up some of those meetings that we talked about, both uh, the outreach meetings as well as some of the sessions with information providers mm -hmm. in the other towns and so forth. Oh, the ADU? Well, do you want to do that again? Yes, we were. We, we thought it it made sense. It was went over so well, uh, and uh, we, this is the type of thing where we really need to. Publish and republish and explain it every year. I think do a so. workshop like yep. that, and we um, should be able to get people, more people there who've actually done it recently, and mm -hmm. and, and, and and tell their stories. Janice has actually you know, mentioned something we've talked about here, which again is that whole discussion about what's what's our objective, and you know there is a provision in our existing town code that allows us to provide for a tax abatement or tax credit. Mm -hmm. Uh, for folks that are creating affordable housing right. uh, based on the delta between the two. So one of the things we've talked about to incentivize, you know, we've, we've amended our zoning regulations to make it easier to create accessory dwelling units, including mm -hmm. detached units in town in certain districts. None of those units, we have have over 200, 200 so far, and I think since we amended our regs further, maybe we've had seven or eight uh, so it's not a lot, uh, but you know, 250 is, is a pretty healthy number. It is. I didn't. But none of those, <laughs> none of those actually count. Right. You know, they don't count towards our affordable housing inventory because there's no deed restriction. So you know, we've talked before about well, how do we how do we get those in the inventory? How do right. we count those units? Credit for them and so forth. Really, the only way you can do it is obviously have a deed restriction, unless uh, you know, based on where we are, it's not like you can do like Trumbull did and, and provide a general amnesty. If you bring it out of the darkness and come into the light of day, then then you, you uh, but you have to enter into this restriction in order to do that. So you, you, it's now legal, but the only way you can have a legal apartment is through it. We've already kind of done that. Uh, so it's really, how do we incentivize people? Because you're you're, re you're restricting the value of that asset, right? In some limiting it, right? And how do you compensate people to offset that if that's what you, you want to get credit for? So you have to pay people. So one way would yeah. be uh, we haven't done it because you know again there's some ambiguity in the regs, uh, but you know Department of Housing's reading of the regulations is it needs a Pretty tough to ask for an accessory dwelling unit. I would. Does it have to be a standalone unit? Can it be attached to the? Well, we have we have uh, provisions in our regs to allow for detached units now, but only in two districts. But it's primarily attached. Primarily part of the main dwelling unit. I don't think it provides a really good for seniors. Yeah, or absolutely. Even if whether we it's whether we get credit for it or not, it provides. It definitely provides yeah. affordable housing. And, and, and this is a type of metric that we should start letting our public know about too. You know, we let them know about the credit points that we get, the progress towards A30 chief. We should also let them know that the good that's being done right. behind the scenes that isn't necessarily counting toward that. And so I think part of our challenge is to is a general education effort to the community about why we need affordable housing, what it, what it gets done, and, and how they can help in this project. We got some work to do there. Yeah. So I, I do think you know just having a workshop every year is a good. Thing. And whether we want to sweeten the pot in some fashion because mm -hmm. we'd like to get more credit for the work that we're doing, whether it counts towards moratorium points or just our general inventory, we can we can. Talk about that. Um, that would be the recommendation is to look at that and go through that would require an ordinance, uh, probably, or at least blessing from. We do have an ordinance, but I'm not sure it's clear enough on the. Um, you may want to talk to uh, at least 
Board of Selectmen, if not uh, leadership, to see if what there is permitting uh, detached units in zones where they aren't currently permitted with a deed restriction would be worth might be an option might be an option mm. that's actually, mm. right now we have people that are and I think it was on today's agenda going the route of a zoning board of appeals uh, and you know again the thought had occurred to me uh, to another similar to that bolster your case and, and or uh, by having a I guess a, a contract with the town to provide housing so one one option would be to, to do it that way Demery is back on the agenda. Well, it's always, it never left. <laughs> <laughs> always there, always left. <laughs> I feel like that would be such a good opportunity. Yes, it, it is. Um, and yeah, I, oh, oh, sorry, Gretchen. <laughs> well, you know, whether it's the Bridgeport Diocese or other dioceses, church, churches own a lot of property. They do. Uh, don't always appreciate all those things. So churches, uh, what, regardless of denomination, um, are looking at those assets periodically and determining, uh, you know, they still as mm -hmm. part of their overall mission. And yeah. so I think yeah. it does provide an opportunity for us to look at those as opportunities. Properties they have in town started with property in on Hill, Hill um, Harris outside of uh, Southport. Uh, had a lot of neighborhood opposition to proposed plans, but you know, they have other other assets in town. Also, something we should you know and not not ignore. What do we think might be a reasonable time frame then for the the uh, redo of the AD seminar or, or mm -hmm. improvement? We we did November fourteenth or seventeenth, mm. I think last year. I'd like to do it a little earlier in the a little fall. Sooner. Uh, be nice in October maybe or September even. Um, September might be pushing it, but October I would think would. Be. It really is just a question of reserving the room and then the speakers. Could even ask the same folks again if we wanted to. They had an architect, um, somebody who had recently gone through the process and built an ADU for their family. We had planning and zoning talking about the regulatory change. Builder would be another. So I thought I thought what we covered last time good. So we could. Yeah, I would replicate that maybe with different speakers uh, to some extent. Um, I'm going to be away the first two weeks in October, not back until the 13th. So if I moderate again, it would be, you know, follows. Do you want to check dates with the museum? Yeah. See what's Absolutely. available. Wait, I think it was a Tuesday evening? Was it a Monday? Monday. It was a Monday. That's right. Monday. It was a Monday. Yeah. Yeah. That's <laughs> right. Tuesdays and Wednesdays. Yeah. It wasn't our first choice, but but it went up being the only. It, it was the only time. I remember that. It, yeah. it, but it worked. It worked well. We had we had a, a good crowd. So if we talk, if, if we look at that, what about the session, the broader session in terms of the, you know, the role and activity of the Affordable Housing Committee, the the housing trust fund, the housing trust fund. Is that possible to do that in fall? Yeah, as well. Yeah. Um, we probably need a little. I, more I think we do it as a separate. That. We might want to do a right. separate, separate, session. separate session. So if yeah. you did one in the ADU, maybe you want to do one in the spring. 
you know, that might be a good time because, you know, you're kind of reporting a mid-year report on where we are in progress on the affordable housing. Have some progress to report? You're, you're thinking letting that go till, till after the first of the year? Oh, well, we have to report annually to the RTM on, on the work that we do, and that could hold into right. a broader conversation with the community. Um, and I'm open to don't want to over commit ourselves to putting there might be other opportunities certainly in groups that we've worked with one speaker will be from the uh, Fairfield County Center for Housing Opportunities and on a series of workshops about housing happy to host some if we wanted to but we can certainly do it. You know, the nice thing is they yeah. kind of provide the backbone support yeah. for this, so we don't have to put it all together. I'm thinking about the, the timing of um, getting the word out to people that we're doing this, we're, we're raising funds for this purpose, purposes, and here's how you can help. Well, the other opportunity, frankly, is that would be up is when we do the groundbreaking there's a really good opportunity yeah. to talk about the work of the affordable housing committee yeah. housing trust fund and how it supported this development habitats work that's an opportunity to really you know talk about this stuff that's why I'd like to get that involved we've talked about even pop-up events we, I structured something for resilient Connecticut July 30th at the farmers market they're going to talk about you know our uh, efforts to combat sea level rise and climate-induced uh, flooding downtown. So they were just doing a study, and they want to get want to create more public awareness and get some input. We could do something like that too. Um, later in the uh, the farmers market runs through the early fall, through October actually. So the downtown. One, yeah. <clears throat> so we could do that. Or oh, there are other opportunities like that at festivals and events. We could just staff a table, and you'd have you know information that you could pass out. The uh, you know I think Bob started yeah. draft you know drafted a brochure, so all that would be would be good. So I think there's a couple opportunities here. It doesn't have to be just. A workshop type. also right. maybe reach out to the PTAs at the schools yep. and have them send out in their e-blast. I've uh, made presentations to the PTA council. Again, it's, yeah. they have a full agenda, so it's helpful right. to have a specific ask for them. Sure. Uh, but even not, just to yeah. advertise like a date for but, seminar. You know, Carolyn mentioned like Rotary is um, a great mm. Uh, that mm -hmm. is interested. They're always looking for speakers. There are opportunities for us to publicize the work that we're doing. I think what well, we've publicized the work, we just haven't had a specific ask before. Right. Maybe it's the housing trust fund. Maybe it's talking about you know your property so we can do more projects with habitat, you know, something, whatever we need to be more forceful in terms of coming education piece is good. A lot of questions, a lot of engagement, how you can help. Maybe we could look at a couple of these types of opportunities on a smaller scale to lay the groundwork in the fall, and then, and then maybe have the larger session. You know, all eyes on Fair TV, hopefully, mm -hmm. uh, after the first of the year. You know, I I think you were on to something for, with uh, some of the groups we started working informally. We probably should create some working committees around a couple of these key topics and on this, like, you know, the groups come back and report. Maybe there's a group mm -hmm. that's talking about education, awareness, marketing. Put a little bit more meat on here, but I think 
I'm happy to support the or whatever. I can attend. You should definitely do that. Set this up, you know. But I think a couple strategic things. I just don't. Not staff, obviously. Yeah. We have me, <laughs> all you volunteers, and so I just don't want to be. Can't be everywhere. You, so you seem to pick, be everywhere. Pick our spot. <laughs> pick our spot. And I am really hopeful that the um, the age-friendly um, community effort that's just really been launched can be a great opportunity to build uh, support and advocacy communication for a lot of these initiatives. And uh, it will housing will clearly be one of the priority domains. So the way this works, there are every every town picks a, a limited number of domains that they view as priorities that they go after and they develop a three year plan with committed objectives and so forth. And uh, it appears early 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 on it appears that transportation and, and housing and that healthcare outreach will probably be, including dementia, will probably be priorities. It'll be a great opportunity, I think, for us to build more mm -hmm. people that are in, in excited about the work that we're doing and want to get involved in the work we're doing, and also uh, uh, build support and advocacy. In the, community. the other thing, as you're talking, about, you know, the senior center obviously is this one, but I'm also mm -hmm. thinking. When you when you have a program like we had the program for the eight youth, it was kind of a one off, but it was nice to integrate that as part of a coordinate, more coordinated strategy where you're kind of replicating some of the same materials in different formats. So, you know, the senior center would be obviously a place that would be a very receptive audience to eight youth. So even if you had a workshop at the Fairfield Museum, you could do a, a follow on um, smaller type, maybe a different Q and A type I think it's great uh, at the senior center, right. and you're kind of building off the same thing. You're not, mm -hmm. so I think we should think of those as kind of cluster. The, the age for the community is not designed to be something for people who are seniors. It was designed nope. for the continuum of, of, of aging for all of us, including people that I like to use the term who are aspiring seniors. <laughs> when we become seniors. Uh, like, so it, I'm dropping hints now. I'm close enough <laughs> myself. So. <laughs> a lot of good ideas here. So maybe all, you know, shortly, you know, after the meeting, we'll we'll start forming some of those subcommittees and getting energized in some of these areas. And, uh, and the same with the Housing Trust Fund. I mean, bit of, I could review a lot of material, uh, certainly other people have plowed the ground before us, uh, but it, we're, we're trying to be responsive to what we identify as our housing needs here, and so uh, it needs some direction from this group, and then obviously for selectmen, because they also have to allocate. You know, if we put something together, Obviously, would be blessed by this group, but I think we want the opportunity to present it to the Board of Selectmen, get their okay, and uh, yeah. you know that's another opportunity for us to publicize a little. Bit. Anything we learn from these meetings, you know, the, the one that Steve and I had from the West Board, and and you may want to do a follow up, in fact, in Westport um, with the, the head of the Planning and Zoning Commission. But um, if we speak to Stanford or various other groups, we can make sure that these subcommittees are informed uh, of what we learn in, in, in terms of. We have a housing developer here, so if you want to ask questions about <laughs> the difficulties in developing two to four family units, um, or just housing in general, why don't we, Kevin, why don't we... Kevin's a guy that can probably give you a, a quick tutorial about the challenges that are out there. Why don't, we, why, don't, why don't we do that? Great idea. You're on the spot. All right. Uh, you know, um, uh, I think primarily it's cost, right? Um, uh, that, yeah, that, that's really the, the greatest uh, challenge is, is the cost in developing those 
uh, smaller, smaller um, density units, you don't can't spread across enough um, enough units to, to really not create them without providing an upfront subsidy on affordability. Um, that's that's why there's not more more people building single family and two family homes throughout Fairfield County. I know you're so kind of atypical because you're not you're not profit and you do have a lot of funds that help support acquisition. Focus in Bridgeport because you, but when you look at a piece of property, what do you typically look to pay on a per unit? Um, generally, we've been paying uh, in the last couple of years in Bridgeport, we've been paying like forty to sixty thousand per unit. Um, really? Yeah, um, for acquisition costs in in Bridgeport. Um, but, I mean, that's Who's typically that's what a what? private developer would look at, too. I mean, uh, or, you know, if you look at... But that's based on two units or one unit or four units? Yeah, well, so, um, you know, so for us, right, when if, um, so we're doing a lot of urban infill development, you know, small 50 by 100, 40 by 80 lots. Um, there's going to be no economy of scale for a for-profit developer to do that, to do that work, really, right? Um, uh, so they've got to, they've got to look at, 20 units because they, you know, they, that's where they're going to get their economies of scale. Um, so that, you know, that's the biggest challenge I think for for lower density development is that per cost per unit cost. Per unit cost and you so also so. build more cheaply, don't you? Because a, a private sector developer is going to take a, a GC 15% or something on top. So. Well, we've got donated materials and labors. Yeah, we also have like yeah, a fair amount of donated material and labor. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, we'd subcontract some trades, but for the most part, it's a lot of, a lot of volunteer labor. And um, yeah, so I, I, you know, there's a developer in Bridgeport that we've been talking with for a couple of years now about doing some potential partnerships on building properties, us helping to finance them. Mm -hmm. But the reality of it is, you know, his cost per unit is like $400,000 to develop a unit where our cost is Two hundred without the land and two eighty with the land. Um, so you know it's it's really um, there's no market to support um, doing those developments. You know profit for him. Yeah. You guys still do community builds, or where where people come and help build up a house, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Most. So maybe we could even do that. Purple Housing Committee of Fairfield could come one Saturday and I yeah. can, I'll paint. That's great. No, I think yeah. I think you guys <laughs> should organize a team okay. for sure. Yeah. 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 It includes you, Mark. You're <laughs> <laughs> I was expecting that. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, and it the, it's interesting. I was just thinking we have a pretty big network of volunteers. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we, we have about eight thousand volunteers that volunteer with our organization annually. Some of those folks undoubtedly live in Fairfield, mm -hmm. all right, and they're mm -hmm. helping us build homes elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So that might be, uh, you know, we, we could potentially refer some some folks that believe in affordable housing and maybe live in your community yep. to to help you folks in your work and your future committees work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it it it's definitely so would help because even with the and not that we've gotten a huge amount of pushback with um, affordable housing initiatives and plans, but, you know, the more support you can generate for have other people there to help champion it, uh, because usually people that show up to meetings are the ones happy about something. Right. So, we have people there in support of something. For sure. That's true. Yeah, yeah, what a refreshing it's, idea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you guys are somewhat uh, that are off in a lot of communities in that respect. I think by virtue of the amount of A30G applications Fairfield has seen, the I feel like the average Fairfield resident is more aware of right. affordable housing, and yeah. you know, you're going to get it one way or the other, right? So best to have some degree of local control over it. Yeah. Um, Fortunately, I think everything's kind of lumped together in people's minds. Project. Uh, some <laughs> project yeah. of rural housing is synonymous with A30G, yeah. so we have to kind of peel that back a little bit. And and uh, the last time, the time before last, when we did our affordable housing plan update, it was a 
very conscious effort to talk about uh, you know having control over creating housing opportunities local solutions got into that so there's still a strong reservoir of that Any other uh, challenges you're seeing out there? I'm sure, you know, I've heard from, you know, again, the private guys are talking about the cost of money. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, material costs are at an all-time high. There's uh, serious labor shortages in the skilled trades, right? So, I mean, frankly, <laughs> that's our that's our challenge at 244 Greenfield is, right, site clearing excavation. We don't do that with volunteers, right? So right. getting contractors that are ready, willing, and available to get going on that work is is a challenge. Once, I always am somewhat relieved once we have a foundation in the ground because then we kind of control it with our staff team and our volunteer team. We can really <laughs> keep pushing. But, uh, yeah, you know, those, those, are, those are real challenges. Um, when do you think we'll break ground on Greenfield Street? Uh, I'll know. I'll have a better time real timeline for you like next week but um you know I call it happen all the time I know I, I get calls from Mark I get calls from the Fairfield Rotary folks my <laughs> development team uh so like uh, our development team was hoping for like an August uh groundbreaking and then a a later uh in the fall like wall raising ceremony um so that we could kind of build some build some excitement and then continue it um that that's I, I should know next week pretty well. Uh, we have an excavation contractor lined up. Once we have a, a firm timeline for the tree removal, then I think we can give you a real sense of the groundbreaking date. Do you think you'd have things framed up before winter? Oh, yeah. 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 Call cool. the Affordable Housing Committee to come help raise yeah. the wall. <laughs> there you go. All right. We'll be there. Steve, Steve, We're in. Steve's always, Steve has been uh, on the modular construction at Sewer mm -hmm. Time, as you know. Oh, that's, that's an interesting idea. Have you seen any cost differential um, savings along the way? So we, we're somewhat unique, and we panelize our, our construction, so we're, we're like modular light. So we build our wall panels at a, in a panel shop with volunteers, and then we assemble them on site. Um, so there's some real time savings to that. We could build we could build a full house in the panel shop in about two and a half days with a group of unskilled, you know, ten unskilled volunteers, and you could assemble that on on the build site in about a week and a half. Um, so uh, we do that approach. The historically habitats done some modular homes. Um, there's uh, you know, it, it, it's for us. It's a it's a balance, right? Because the the volunteers are also oftentimes the donors and the funders of our projects, right? So right. they want to right. help uh, build the home, and kind of the best part of building the home with volunteers is the early phase of things, right? Walls, mm. uh, raising, you know, siding. It's the the finishes that tend to slow down the project. So our approach uh, has been more so to get a shell of a house built with volunteers and then use more subcontractors at the end of the project um, to expedite things. Um, but yeah, the, you know, the modular industry wise, the modular um, has been talked about as like a silver bullet solution for 30 years. And it's never really off in a, in a significant way. Um, you know, that may be changing though with, the, the lack of skilled tradespeople, right? Uh, the efficiencies of building in a factory might are going to be more and more so um, valuable when when you just don't have people that. Where's your panel shops? Uh, in Bridgeport. In our, same, same, yeah, same, same storage. Place. Yeah. Do developers yeah. resist having the modular homes? Um, I don't think I I don't think they're people really are loath to change, but they've yeah, been doing. Yeah, yeah. And I wonder if that. Um, they, uh, you know, I, I think there's there's not big enough cost savings right. yet mm -hmm. for for folks to do to things differently than they have always have, essentially. Mm -hmm. 
but you say you can do this in two and a half days and everything. Sure. Whereas if it's on site, my goodness, that seems to take sure. forever and ever and ever. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, again, that part of that is because we have we have a 16,000 square foot panel shop, yeah. right? Where yeah. a yeah. private developer probably isn't going to bear the cost of right. of having that facility. Right, so they're gonna they're gonna build for things on site as they can. Um, yes, yeah, so we're kind of a unique animal in that. We need to get more projects going. Yes, yeah. exactly. Exactly. Kevin, have you built any tiny houses? Uh, so I guess it's a question of what your definition of a tiny house is. We have hundred square feet. Yeah, no, we haven't built anything that small. Um, we generally we're building three bedroom, bath, and a half homes. Uh, like actually all four homes on Greenfield are, are four bedroom, two bath. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a, a, a big increase in like multi-generational fa multi families applying to the program. So they, the demand for four bedroom units has been much bigger the last few years. Mm -hmm. um, we built some, we built condo complexes, um, unit condo complex in, in Bridgeport. Um, and uh, an eight-unit condo complex in Stanford. Those were a mix of one, two, three bedroom units. Um, and we've built some standalone two-bedroom homes just on really small sites. So that's one thing to consider, you know, oftentimes sites that are kind of considered unbuildable by uh, most builder standards, we can potentially um, you know, fit that works for some family size. But yeah, we haven't done a lot of um, really small tiny homes. Your houses are they designed individually, or do you have a pattern or like a pattern book? You know that you yeah, we have a pretty standardized set of designs. You know, a few designs, and we do different iterations of that based on site conditions and specific mm -hmm. family needs. Um, but. Uh, I always say, like, if you once you can identify a habitat home in Bridgeport, you can probably pick out the other 140 or so that are uh, around, you know, <laughs> because they're they're noticeable uh, some similarities, you know, and that's that's the economies of scale, right? That's uh, mm -hmm. sure, sure. Well, if you look what was built in the early part of the 20th century, you can go along a street and you see that yeah. they're all alike. Yep. <laughs> you know, that that's not uncommon. Yeah. <laughs> So before we leave this, do we want to just talk about uh, uh, future speakers? And yeah, I, I've asked uh, and Aisha, Fairfield um, um, County Center for Housing Opportunities. I think you guys, some of you may have also received a survey from them. Oh, right. Um, yep. And so I uh, responded. Uh, if you respond, that's fine too. Uh, but they were um, they were asking about you know the progress in affordable housing plans and where we are with all that. And so I you know hopefully they'll get responses from a number of communities within their footprint. But I thought it might be helpful for the this committee yes. to hear from mm, yeah. from them as to what resources they have. Obviously, they do jobs, and they're they're uh, <coughs> a group that's focused on advocacy and education and awareness. Uh, but they also they might also provide an opportunity for them to report back on some of their preliminary findings from the survey. So I'm hoping that Aisha said she would come to this meeting. And then, you know, I think we can um, share with you some other thoughts. But there's certainly other groups like that. Advocacy uh, groups, groups that are talking about uh, may provide resources right. to assist the committee in the partnership. Mm -hmm. We've talked to um, <clears throat> groups. Uh, I, I've been a really frequent uh, panelist at, at the, the New Haven South uh, Southern Connecticut. I forget what the Council of Governments is. Mm -hmm. I think it's Rock, the South Central Connecticut. Uh, Area around New Haven, a lot of suburban towns, a very active group that uh, 
surprise to their mayors and first selectmen and, and planners talking about affordable housing. I thought, you know, again, sending people over there, I was on a first selectman in Guilford. But, you know, an opportunity for us to exchange billing uh, and learn from them. And then folks like Habitat and other nonprofit developers that are out there, just the other potential partners, funders. Housing Development Fund I've talked to, helpful financing projects. On kind of cool, but an office conversion is still a very good candidate. Version to um, Jeff is very interested in that. So, a great site for it. Um, all uh, office, the office space that you know, a lot of office is being converted right. over. So, it's, um, but not everything structurally works well. So, I think there's, we have one each month. So, guys, with your work. We'll continue the conversation online about those sessions and other potential ones. Yeah, if anyone has any, like, burning, like, I have questions, I, I really would like to hear from this or... I need right. to know more about that. Let me know because um, I'm sure we can we can attend. So I sent a, a note to Mark uh, suggesting maybe we we meet with Stanford and and I sent him a, a file that he said was seven meg, uh, and it's a it's this it's a it's their their plan. It's very data oriented. But there's a lot of interesting stuff in there. So Mark, understandably, wrote back and said, you know. I was hoping Priori any priorities here. Or I was hoping that Herb had read it and was going to tell me the page that I should be looking at. <laughs> but there were some there were some interesting concepts there about um, paper per capita goal for their housing trust fund in terms of sizing the fund and and uh, they're undertaking a land inventory process uh, throughout the town and they have a cadre of below market rate developers that they work with. And uh, apparently, with some success, we know some of those developers. They don't necessarily have a great reputation here, uh, but but uh, <laughs> I know what you're talking about. But uh, but uh, yeah, and they have some other like a small landlord fund. So some interesting ideas that that you know that may may be may not be as much as appears on the surface once we peel back the you know the the onion. But um, this is Stanford. Right? Stanford. So going back to the um, the money that goes into the trust fund, what they're proposing is yeah. right now they they have money dedicated in the budget, town budget, city budget, like seven dollars per capita, and they want to go up to thirty five or thirty seven dollars per capita. Wow. So Fairfield, if we had like ten dollars per capita, that'd be six hundred thousand dollars in the town budget. If it was thirty seven dollars. Capital, we'd be a million or something. So we're never going to get four million. And so maybe we could get five dollars per capita, ten dollars. I, I think uh, I think our challenge will be, you know, once we've demonstrated success with what we're doing in terms of creating units. Stanford has been at this for a long time. Have a track record to. to um, once you can. Do that, then I think it'll be a lot easier to bring dollars. Well, if I give, then this is the outcome, and have something to you fall back on the towel. Right now, I think the response is, oh, you know, what have you done? You already have dollars. Yeah. What have you done with it? Yeah. Um, it's, 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 um, so we need to get a couple more success and wins, and then mm -hmm. I think it'll be easier. Right? You know, maybe we can talk about uh, changing the inclusionary fee or coming up with other funding sources. Uh, uh, 
but then, you know, the, the lesson is that we don't have to create this ourselves. Some genes, Stanford's one, it's not necessarily comparable to Fairfield, but they've had a housing trust, have had, you know, a program for a while, and they also have, you know, some other tools. And we've talked about whether or not we want to, at the time we kept it simple, Want, if you're going to build housing, you're going to create some units within that development and pension. But you know, it doesn't. For example, we've talked about the limitations of that approach as it comes to ownership housing. We have such disparities in sale prices between and a market rate unit. Mm -hmm. Market rate units going for 1.3, and the full unit supposed to be selling. For that that creates in a condo situation right. with home, uh, it creates issues. Yeah. And so, you know, maybe there are there are there should be some. For other options, whether it's off-site development or, or so these are things that we should revisit. You know, whether ten units we have a ten unit trigger should be reduced from ten to five. You know, five you have to give us ten. So. Not just just not just going from ten to twenty right. or ten to fifteen, but you know maybe there's other things we sure. can. A lot of got a lot of good ideas and discussion yep. tonight. Uh, we can probably if unless someone has an area here you want to probe or pursue further, maybe we can just sort of move into our usual wrap up of. The yeah, I'll items. give you a quick quick uh, rundown. Um, I don't know of any other uh, pending uh, A30G applications right now. I, I think Berkeley was was it. Mm -hmm. That was denied. Do you uh, think that was denied on appeal? Right. You know, if it hasn't, it will be appealed. Um, the moratorium, uh, where we are with regard to what we're essentially where we were last month because we're waiting for three projects to get sealed. Uh, they're all well well underway. Uh, in on Blackrock Turnpike's furthest along. Yes. Park yes. Avenue is, is moving ahead pretty briskly. They're the same thing. All three of those projects, Park Avenue in particular, will be the hump. Yeah. Uh, I don't anticipate that until um, early next year. I read that the town got $2 million to help remediate. Well, the town has taken the state money to remediate property that a private developer is going to develop. And what does the town get out of that? So here's the so this is a negotiation. Um, we have a development uh, POD development next to the train station. Uh, it's a brownfield site. There was an opportunity to apply for brownfield funding to pass it through the developer. Um, we were successful. Uh, I'm trying to keep the developer in the program. Uh, there's a lot of um, things. You have to pay prevailing wage. You have to have a negative pledge and use restrictions on the asset, which complicates. Um, uh, CIPO, SIPA, all other obligations. The state does not make it easy to do. All these things would scare the hell out of most developers. Um, I've kept this developer in line. Now, the benefit to the town is it was approved. Uh, well, they haven't approved the project, but they've approved the text amendment which enables the project, which requires a 12% set aside at or below 80%. DECD will require a higher percentage of the So the diff the issue is what is the what is the value of that subsidy to the developer? You may think it's three million dollars, but it's not quite three million dollars. It's something less than that. Up front versus the forty year uh, delta between what he would ordinarily provide in terms of money. It's a it's a math. Right? So 
we're evaluating the benefits and the cost and looking at the impact of the higher percentage of affordability. And to me, I think it makes sense for us to try to got a development that's going to happen. Try to bump up the percentage of affordable because it's happening. So I'd like to see they typically want 20% at 80%. For me, I'd like to see a percentage at or below 60%. What that percentage is is going to be a factor of how much that $3 million is looking to go, what the state will accept. This could all blow up and the developer will say, thanks, but no thanks. He doesn't really need the money. He can build this project. That That is the problem that I've, with the state, uh, with trying to do projects in a housing market like Fairfield. They don't need the dollars. I've got to make it attractive enough for them. One way is to access some state dollars to offset some downfield remedial costs. That only gets us so far. So that's the challenge, I think. So it, it's may not gonna proof will be in the next probably ninety days. And we have a similar issue with accurate the Connecticut Challenge Grant. So I, I were able to get three million dollars to offset the cost of sewer infrastructure. Sorely need because we've deferred them forever. We have an area where we've got an aging pipe that has to be replaced. Cost is like twenty million dollars been able to get $3 million from the state. And the developer benefits, but not directly. And so we're, he's being asked to provide a million dollar personal guarantee, along with these other requirements. And um, so far, I'm just saying, you know, stay in the program, because we really want, you know, this, we want the, the money for the sewer, but we also want him to do as much as he can much as we can get in terms of so you, you can create a floor. The floor is the inclusionary zoning regulation, whatever that percentage is, 10, 12, 15 percent. That needs to be economically viable, I think, for the majority of projects. Otherwise it, we're not going to create housing units. But beyond that, we can also use other tools to incentivize people to do more. They might not, have, and that's that's my issue with the state. You know, you have to pay this. You have to pay more for housing, for land in Fairfield. If we want to develop in Fairfield, we're going to have to pay more than forty thousand dollars per unit. State, uh, you know, they have their formula. Look at it and say, oh, geez, you know, we can get more bang for the buck going over here. Right. Well, you can, but then you can't hold us. Do you want units here? Right. Isn't that a flood zone? Uh, it, is it is it's not. It is, but it, there is a, we're going to need, because the corner, the corner touches it. So we're going to need a flood management certificate. I mean, we had this webinar. He was on the webinar with me today, and I could just see probably smoke coming out because it was just a litany of all this stuff that you have to do. And it was like, oh, my God. I hope he's... You know, will you please talk to me after this? But mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's complicated. But yeah, we we should do the. I'll 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 run that past you, Steve. With the I have an appraiser that's looking at it. My thought was take his pro forma worksheet. So I have to you know back in some numbers and make some. It's an appraiser, and what the appraiser will do is value the subsidy against the additional cost. And if we have a delta, then I can report that fashion, and we know what that is, and we can about how to close that. Gap. That um, appraiser going to give you like development numbers, rents per apartment. <clears throat> what I expenses? I share with him my. Worksheet that I did, yeah. my market uh, uh, 
I did a quick market survey, and it's basically asking rents for some of these multifamily developments. So it's probably inflated because they'll negotiate those down from what they were. But it's eye popping some of the numbers. But I don't think they're too far off. But you know, it also showed vacancy for these multifamily units overall is three percent. Um, there were no affordable units available at the time, and you know there was a. We know what the delta is between the market and what the fair market rent units would be, and we can project that out over 40 years and see what the cost is. Curious about the expenses. Me too, because you had seven thousand. What what do you use for operating expenses? You, know, you do ownership, so I don't. Know. Yeah, we don't really. Yeah. I think it's all over the map, but yeah, I will, I will, I'm asking him to take a look at the quality of his numbers. Mark, Mark anything else from any of these other items? Or? No, Parkview, I mentioned. Uh, Greenfield, we're looking to cut down some trees <laughs> and do some site work. And uh, St. Emery's, uh, no change. Mark you hopefully, and thank you for your comments. All that out in the street, I had passed it. Herb and Steve, to, yeah, it gives a couple of thoughts. Mm -hmm. RFQ. I had a question. This is an RFQ, and why not an RFP? Or when you get done with this, it's well, a kind of accommodation. We kind of yeah. ask for right, you so know a development concept for the site. You know, we give some some broad direction. We've given some idea of potential workarounds. Your question about use of the town permitted in residential zones. That's my zoning workaround. We used that successfully for Greenfield Street. You know, we did a 10-unit development on a half-acre parcel. That's not in our zoning regulations. But Austin Wolf who that well, use of the town is permitted in a residential zone. This is use of the town, so you can approve it as is. Zoning Commission said, yep, we can do that. So I remind Jim periodically of that because, you know, I don't I don't think it's what well, 830G is a builder's remedy. I don't think it's a good look for the town to do 830G. Have people in partnership with the town doing 830G association. So couple options, but I think the bottom line here is we're either 9,000 square foot lots in the residence fee zone, so there could be duplex building lots, but again, right. I think we'd like to aggressive, but still contextual with the neighborhood, so maybe a three or a four family if we can do it. That's, we're going to ask people like Kevin to get back to us with their but is, is it like a comedy? Anything else? Any, any, uh, any other new business? No. I wish I wish I had more. <laughs> any anything else other new business? That any of the committee wants to bring up? You ready for adjournment? Sure. <laughs> Motion to adjourn. We had a quorum tonight, right? We did. Yeah, we did. Mm -hmm. yeah. The only thing we voted on was the next so. <laughs> And according to uh, the people who provide the training for this, the only thing I need to record is the people who are here, the people who are absent, and any recorded votes. All to order, the time you adjourn, and any recorded votes. That's pretty much all you're required to yeah. do for yeah. a minute. If people want to view the whole thing, they can go over there and instruct them. Uh, I will. Uh, That's uh, true. Thank you. Thank you.